I'm going to say this wrong, School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration. And she will be talking about her agency's experience of going from transitioning from paper to electronic records. She has been employed with the State of Utah School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration in the Oil and Gas Division for 14 years. Her duties include land research exchanges, GIS mapping, and records analyst. And then following Lisa will be Kendra Yates from the Utah State Archives. The title of her presentation is Transitioning to a Paperless Office, Popular Conceptions, Myths or Otherwise. Um, Kendra is the Records Analyst Section Manager at the Utah State Archives and loves working with records officers and other government officials in our state. She has a Bachelor's of Arts in History from the University of Utah and a Master's of Library Science. So please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to let you know I don't have any sound effects, but we do have maps at CITLA. <laughs> um, so the School Institutional Trust Lands Agency is known as CITLA. It's a mouthful of words, so I'm just going to go by CITLA if I talk about our agency and how we've become, we're trying to get into a paperless world. Um, CITLA's previous record keeping was a little mundane. We had a large public, public room that was filled with documents. Um, we had uh, to update plat books, and these plat books were really huge. I'm just going to give one out here. So this is an example of one of the plat pages that we had to update. And the pink squares, the filled in uh, blocks, those were actually painted. We had to take a paintbrush out and some paint, and we would paint the squares as we acquired the lands. So it was mundane. And then as we sold lands or acquired lands, you know, we wrote them down into <laughs> little notes on here. So it was really quite a tedious job that we had to overcome. Um, also, we had these books that are serial register pages. Um, I probably didn't know, I don't know if anybody knows about CITLA. We're an uh, uh, agency that actually has state lands, and those state lands we uh, manage to create uh, funding for the school systems. And we have uh, 12 other beneficiaries that are involved in that too. So. Um, what we do, we lease out the lands, and a part of that uh, leasing out is like through oil and gas or grazing permits and some sort of that. So our serial register pages are through our lease files, and it's just kind of a generalization of a page or two talking about the lease of the lands. And we had up to 100 binders And they were this thick and one or two pages of just one lease. And as they were updated, uh, one comment that was put in, one person had to pull out the old one and put in a new page. So it was really kind of mundane. Um, we have numerous source documents. A source document is a piece of document that we acquired lands. Um, and so it just showed how we received lands and how we uh, sold off some lands, too. Could have been a certificate of sale, clear list, or patent. Um, the de department itself of oil and gas, they had over 20 uh, files. There was like three drawers worth. Uh, they roughly ran like 40 by 20. And um, now, and so it was really cumbersome to have that whole lease files that would uh, clutter the whole area, and we had less uh, room to fit in. Uh, the present time, our record uh, keeping, we have a smaller public room. We actually have like three or four offices that we created because we have sort of our, our painted uh, plats that we have to follow. We're in the process of scanning those. We're down to like 60 books now. 
Um, and in the process, touch the land exchanges yet because some of those land exchanges they can be like three inches thick and there's like six or seven uh, files folders for those. Um, the oil and gas department itself has uh, decreased their filing cabinets down to five and we've scanned over 3,000 over 3,000 <laughs> leases and that includes the active and the inactive. And roughly we have about 240 uh, active leases to be scanned. Uh, the surface, they have their own uh, leases. They have grazing permits. Um, they have areas that they uh, do windmill. Um, they have also, help me out, Diane, tell me. I'm, I'm just blank because I don't work in the surface department. But they have way more uh, commodities areas that they, they deal with. Um, so what are the two keys that why we're going digital with our records? Well, it benefits the public and then it also benefits CITLA. Uh, how it benefits the pub public, we provide a self-service uh, scanned records through our CITLA website. And I'll show you that a little bit later. And then we also reduce the time uh, for uh, people, the public, to come and review the files. We have a lot of oil and gas companies that are from other states, uh, down in Texas, Colorado, um, some even further than that. And they really appreciate those scanned files. I worked in the private sector before I went to the state of Utah, and I loved when I could get acquire a lease um, from a digital, but it, it was a little bit less known back then. Now we have that capability, and it's just amazing that you know these people are so excited and said, "You mean you can send that to me today?" So, um, so it's a quick access to the records. The benefits for CITLA, it saves the CITLA time and money um, by pulling, um, in pulling the files and copying them. People would come in, and we have this grocery cart. <laughs> in our office and one person could fill up the whole grocery cart and review those all day long and they were not allowed in, a, in our filing uh, area so we would have to pull those files and then later on we would have to make those copies for them. Some of these uh, files, one lease alone for an oil and gas, there's four uh, files and it's roughly like two inches uh, thick and so each file have like has like a over 500 copies in it. So it was very time consuming for our employees. It eliminates the mishandling of files. At one time we let the public uh, copy off these leases, but they were putting them out of order. <laughs> and also it, a lot of the documents were being ripped because they were so fragile. I mean, some of these uh, leases were we're back from um, the 1960s. Um, it reduces the filing space and it, then it creates additional uh, usable office space. In the oil and gas, we've created two other uh, office space. We were really tight fit it and now we've expanded a little bit in our area. The area offices, we do have a Richfield, a Moab, and a St. George. And then they have the capability of whatever is done in our office up in Salt Lake to be scanned and then sent to them. Um, documents are available at the employee's computer. Um, where I'm a research analyst and I research some of the lands, I can have several documents up all at once. Before I would have to pull out the plat book page and the survey plat the source document. We'd have to go down to the BLM before they had their website and go down and research their information. So it's really created a, a, a more friendly uh, environment for me as a research analyst. And then also um, digital copies are stored 
I just wanted to say there are digital copies are stored in a document management system. We use Documentum. DEQ is our host uh, server, and so we they provide the space for us to store our information. So current issues in the filing <laughs> mode, we do digital plus we do the paper. And the reason behind that, we're waiting for our legal group to approve the accepting of digital signatures as an equal to the original signatures. And I'm talking about the lease files, because eventually what we want to do, we want to go to where a company can do their assignment online with the digital signature page. Send it in, we do all the information, and then we can send it back to them. But it's still up in the airs through the legal uh, team to do that. Um, our scanned documents in various formats, we have some that are scanned in TIFF. That was the first papers that were actually scanned. A lot of our uh, source documents are scanned that way, and they are so poor resolution. So I would advise, even though it set, saves space, if you really want a good resolution to go with a, a better format. Um, the lag time between a approval of a lease assignment and updating this uh, scan file is still an issue, but we even had that issue when we were in uh, the paper world because we, um, where we have a board that we have to approve our uh, actions, it, it usually takes a two-week period to go through the director's uh, minutes. They look it over, they approve it, comes back to us, we have to put it into the system and then file that, that information. So I just wanted to explain maybe a little bit about how we are scanning our lease files. They're a little bit different. We have it set up as a portfolio and it's under a, a, portfolio, a portfolio 9 Pro. And that is a very old version. Um, the pros of it, the files within a folder, so we had several files and then it looked like it was in a folder. So there's like a layout grid that looks like tabs that you can go into separate section areas. Um, because of that, it eliminates scrolling through multiple pages. We also have set bookmarks, too, so if you wanted a certain assignment that you wanted to go to, you can click on that, and then it will take you to that, that uh, document itself. The, the problem with that, <laughs> we have found that when we wanted to update our Adobe, and it sounds like everybody has this problem, that it had a different grid look out and, uh, or set up. And the public does not like changes. They will call you and say, this looks different. What's wrong? What's going on? And so we're working with our IT department plus our main scanners and reviewing the new Pro DC version. DC is document cloud, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be stored in the cloud. We're still going to going to continue to store it into our document um, server. Um, we feel like this version is working better. Uh, we, we're still in the process of pulling it in and using this update version. And so we have an intern that's uh, looking at this. This intern basically does scanning. That's all he does. And then um, Sitla is about to do this uh, change in about 2016. So now I want to show you um, a portfolio of how it's set up. This is under Adobe Pro 9, so it's going to look a little bit different when we go to DC, but it's going to be the basic situation. Um, we have a business system and everything is linked through a lease or a township and range because that's how we do our business. Um, so this is the oil and gas version. It's very basic. Surface, their raising permits are a little bit more detailed than ours. They have more tabs. Um, so this is the lease ownership. 
this is actually a Word document that we pulled in because this lease, this Word document, we have a tendency to change because it's uh, updating the lease ownership. So anytime we do an assignment change, we note the information, but we keep the original information of, of what the assignment was prior to that. So we hit the preview button, it'll pull up this sheet, and then up in the right hand corner you see open file, you push on that and then it will take you st straight to that Word document, I went too fast, will take you straight to that Word document, you can update the information and then save it, it goes back to the portfolio and it, it's done. Um, you can do that with Excel spreadsheets too. I, I, well, chronologically, um, we have our oil and gas customers will come in and they will actually view these leases by date because they have to do title op opinions and they have to review that legally before they do any drilling or any business on our lands to make sure they have everything in order. Now if you look and just in the middle section, this is where what I was talking about, the bookmarks. So right now it's scrolled to the assignment change that was done back in 2013. If I tab on the next bookmark, it will take me to the application documents. This can go on forever with our bigger files, but I just thought I would show you a basic one. And then the last one is the lease assignment or amendment or assignment, excuse me, or contract. This is actually under the lease file too, but sometimes people just want to go straight to the lease file uh, contract. So we just set that up for them too. So this is our website. Um, to get to the land and lease records, you would click on to the middle uh, picture that's in the lower portion of the screen. It'll take you to here. You can go to the ownership module, which is the land. The uh, title plats are uh, tied to that, historical ones. But I'm going to show you the contract module. So it'll take you to this area here. You type in the lease that you're referring to if you wanted to see uh, a document or any information that it has tied to the business system. And up into the middle portion where the, you see some icons, anything in red, that is what we have scanned so far. So we have a great GIS uh, mapping department and they're so good about um, creating these maps for us. And so the, we'll pull in a map to that shows the area that that piece of land is in. But this is changing. This is actually going to be our new land and lease records because we thought the original one was a little bit outdated. So now we created this. When you go into it, this will pull up. And then if you can see over in the left-hand corner, it shows that I've typed in the lease number. It'll take you to this. Then you'll be hit the arrow on the where I have it in red, this screen will come up. You can select from that or up at the top just where that red uh, button is, that will take you to the documents itself. This uh, window will come up. You can pick on any document that you want to view, click on it, and it will take you straight to your document. So uh, suggestions I would give, I would hire interns. Each department has their own scanner. Our surface has their own scanner, oil and gas does. Um, we have an administration scanner, which they took care of the source documents. Um, we also had the development. And then legal did their scanning too. Uh, I suggest personal uh, scanners on your desk. That is very helpful, especially we have people that do the first run of the lease to how to set it up. Then we have other additional employees, not just the scanners, that can update those files. Um, we do have a large scanner that's upstairs 
that scans our plat maps, our maps, uh, GIS maps. Um, we had some director's minutes that were in huge books too that we scanned. Um, and then decide on a format right up front what you're going to do as far as to make the resolution. Uh, the PDFs, you can do an OCR search on that if you if you do a recognition of that. That way, you can uh, when you're in that PDF file, you can put in a name and it'll take you to wherever that name shows up in that PDF file. And then um, scan in phases. Take your time. We started back in 2011 and just took projects here and there and eventually we're getting closer to where we think we're making some headway. We feel like we're behind <laughs> still, but we've, get, we've gotten some comments back from the public and they do re appreciate our work. You get a lot of these leases scanned and they'll call up and they say, well, where's this one? They said, okay, well, this one has like four files. You just got to be patient with us. We did scan one file, and I know Surface has done this too, where we've tested a file that was big enough that we had to split it. So we just named it the same lease number, but dash one and dash two. And then that way, when somebody pulls up those files, it's they're not waiting forever to pull it up. So any questions? <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> I was nervous anyway. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Moved it. I'm sorry, which one is it? Which one is yours? This one? Yeah. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. That's hers. Do you need to do anything? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll start. No, because it is it still stuck in there. No, no, that's what you need to do. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Gina was just arranging it so that this would stream live. We've got people listening from far away, so it's fun. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just really short, so I have to figure out how to see this and still talk into this. Um, hi, my name is Kendra Yates. I am the records analyst manager at the Utah State Archives. And one of the people that I supervise is Lorian Outerkirk, um, the organizer of this event. And I just think that maybe, we, if you don't mind, she deserves a round of applause. So. Uh, thank you, Lorian, uh, for your hard work putting this together. I think the only mistake that she may have made is putting me on the program. <laughs> um, did you know fear of public speaking ranks higher than the fear of death? It's true. Fear of public speaking is not people's number one, and fear of death is number two. Um, I actually am the mother of three teenagers, so I have fears that are much worse than either of those things. Um, 
but it's still hard, you know, to calm the nerves. Anyway, I'm really, I'm grateful you're here, and I'm grateful to be here. What I'm going to talk about, hopefully, is kind of how to decide whether or not you should transition to a paperless office or just transition a process to paperless. Um, we hear a lot of interesting notions expressed from records managers. Um, we have kind of a unique view. We get to answer questions, and, and we do. We tend to hear a lot of interesting notions uh, that have to do with electronic records and going paperless, uh, which is what I mean by popular conceptions, myths or otherwise. So what I'd like to kind of do is just play a little true or false. Um, game as we go along. So let's just start with the first one. True or false? We at the archives don't care what you think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's false. Um, yeah, I mean, our purpose, our, our purpose, our job is to help you be successful in establishing a records management program. Uh, something that makes your job easier, because we know you have a hard job and that you're underappreciated. We know those things. Um, we also want you to protect your agency, though, and we want you to be able to provide transparency. And we treasure your feedback. We actually beg for it. We have a, a blog, and we ask all the time, please tell us what you think of our general schedule. Please tell us what you think of this, that, or the other. Um, and we try to answer what you ask, what I like to call points of pain. We listen to the questions that are coming in. So that's kind of the reason I decided to address this as a true or false, because some of the things that come in, we go, wow, these are um, some of them are really off base, <laughs> so we're just trying to, to, I guess, clear up some of those misconceptions. One of the most common questions that we get is, can we destroy our paper originals after scanning them? And last spring at our records management conference, last April, there was clear interest in the subject. It kind of came up as a question. Um, so that's part of what I want to answer is that question. So, true or false, the question, can we destroy the paper after we scan it, has a single yes or no answer. <laughs> right, it's false. Um, when this subject came up at the Spring Records Management Conference, there was some frustration. Uh, people wondered why the records analysts, that's us, at the State Archives told some agencies yes and some agencies no, or why we were reluctant to give them a yes or no and just wanted to talk about the issues associated with it instead. Um, and that's because there is no yes or no, single yes or no answer to that question. There are a lot of factors to consider, um, and a decision needs to actually be made for each group of records or record series that you're dealing with. And so I actually kind of envisioned making this really fun, well, you could call it a selectomatic, but like a choose-your-own-adventure tool, and you guys could answer questions, and it would lead you one way or another, and eventually you'd get a yes or a no, or a call, you know, your records analyst, because there's no definitive answer. Um, but the flow chart of all of that would be really horrific. Um, this is a simple, whether, you know, this is an internal one that, that my colleague Renee Wilson created, um, she made a selectomatic actually for fun. Um, just deciding with a series specific retention schedule, whether like a record series, whether or not to update it or how to go about doing that. And that's just a really simple process. What we're talking about would be much, much more complicated. And frankly, it is more profitable for you and the agencies to learn about the issues that need to be considered, like teaching you to fish instead of handing you a fish. So instead, what I hope to provide is guidance. Uh, a tour through a maze, some of the factors that need to be considered as you make your decision. So, some factors that you need to consider. Whether or not to destroy paper after you scan it, these are the things you need to think about. Whether or not, or I'm sorry, but how long the records need to be kept, so what their retention schedule is. Um, the importance of the records after doing a risk assessment. How about requirements for managing electronic records? Liability to your agency if you don't have the record when you need it. Standards used for imaging the records. Quality control process, file format, media and storage, software characteristics, capability, ability to dispose of electronic records. Migration plan, cost of maintenance. It can get a little overwhelming. So this is my palate cleanser for your brains. Forget that I showed you that list. We're just going to start with one thing at a time. So true or false, we are not creating 
any records because they are all being done electronically. This was a, this is a true quote from a records officer. It says, this is, these are some of the things that concern us <laughs> um, when we hear this. But you guys are here. I know you know this. Um, so yes, it's false. Um, how about this one? Elect oh, sorry. No, the electronic records, this is answering that question. This is the definition of a record according to grandma. Three basic points. Uh, excuse me. The key one being that electronic records are records, too. So true or false, retention schedules mandate the amount of time that records must be maintained and authorized destruction or transfer of the records once that mandated time period has ended. True. Yep. Uh, this is what they look like. If you I outlined in red for you the records you're dealing with, include that and you notice that open record meaning that's the stuff that open records, sorry. Open meeting minutes and public materials, that includes the agenda and things handed out at the meetings. All of that's a permanent. But if you record the meeting, that only has to be kept three years after they've been approved. And then you can destroy them. And that's, of course, if the official written minutes have been, uh, minutes have been written down. So that's basically what they look like. So true or false, retention schedules only apply to paper records. Yeah, you guys know too much. Um, yes. There you go. Uniform Transaction, Electronic Re Transaction Act says right there, you have to establish retention schedules for uh, electronic records. So here, this kind of answers a question that we had earlier, but only the record copy is subject to the retention schedule. So this is key to know. Um, you can make access, reference, and backup copies that can be destroyed sooner. So that means that you can actually designate the digitized copy of a record as the record copy and destroy the original paper format if it makes sense when you take into consideration all the factors, things that we've been discussing today and things that I'll continue to discuss. I haven't quite got, they were in that list at the beginning, but it is possible to do that. There's just a big if uh, connected. So retention schedules are suggestions. This is a true quote as well. Suggestions of how long you have to keep something, but they are minimums. You can keep records as long as you want. You don't have to destroy them. That is false. It's false. Um, the law says that you shall maintain and destroy records in accordance with those retention schedules. This, so the reason I bring this up, it's important to know this when you're dealing with electronic records in a database, right? That's that's a big challenge when you're dealing with electronic records in a database. So disposition options are destroy or never destroy, which we also tend to call permanent. Um, and that usually means transfer the record copy to the state archives. So disposition begins when the retention period has expired. And it can be delayed under those circumstances there. Um, litigation holds if there's a pending grammar request, requests, that sort of thing, or they're being used in an audit. And then once those things are resolved, the disposition can occur. So true or false, and definitely is a retention period. It's false. But we hear that a lot when we ask specifically, how long are you going to keep the records in your database? Right? We have a lot of people say, well, indefinitely. Indefinite, by definition, is undefined. We go to a lot of trouble to define retention retention periods. We appraise the records, we determine their administrative, fiscal, legal, and historical value. We present them before the State Records Committee in hearing and get their approval of that retention. All of that work we do just so that we can define the retention period. So, yeah, it just doesn't work. and definitely doesn't work. Uh, but it's tempting. So, scan into the database is not an appropriate disposition, true or false. True. This is a quote, too. Someone was trying to use that as a, as a disposition. But like we said, it's destroy or never destroy. Records in a database must still be maintained. Right. They still have to be uh, managed according to retention schedules. So core requirements for managing electronic records. Uh, there are four core requirements. These are internationally and nationally accepted in the records management field. You can find these in a couple of documents that we produce. Um, 
One is called the State Archives Electronic Records Man or Electronic Record Management Business Case. This is the other one. It's the Electronic Records Management and Migration, the guideline that we've put out. Um, so basically, accessible, right? They have to be available for the entire retention period. Authentic, they have to be what they say they are. Nothing can have been changed. Uh, they need to be reliable. We've talked about a lot of these things today. Um, the data has to be retrievable and usable at all times. So that's the whole migration thing. Uh, and they have to be secured. Those that have rights to see those need to have the ability to see those. And those that don't need to not. Um, the systems must be trustworthy. So that's hardware, software, and processes that manage the records must be reasonably secure from misuse and intrusion. So DTS, or IT, manages our electronic records. This one came up just this week. Yeah, that's correct. It's false. That's not true. DTS or IT does not manage records. They manage systems. DTS does not maintain records according to retention schedules. That is your job. So you need to know your system. You need to know how records will be maintained through the retention period. So some of these questions I'm just going to throw a few at you are in this document again and are a really good starting place for a discussion with your IT uh, department. But uh, how will we protect the unauthorized access and, and uh, provide authorized access? How will records be deleted from the system? when their retention period has ended. How is your database going to make that happen or your system going to make that happen? Because you must prevent deletion from impacting other records that should be retained. This is a really hard thing to do in a relational database where the tables are interrelated. Um, so you have to think about the different processes and records and information and, and if they're different scheduled with different retention schedules. Very tricky. Uh, how will permanent records be transferred to the state archives in a way that documents the data structure? Um, how to protect from unauthorized destruction or to hold in cases of litigation hold or for other reasons? And then those processes that we, you know, that you decide on, how are you documenting that so it's consistently applied? So all of the information in our database will be kept permanently, even when we migrate to a new system. Yeah, you guys have been through a migration before, I can tell. So that's false. IT will migrate only what they know you need. So you need to coordinate. It takes a lot of coordination with IT when they are making plans for a system upgrade. Discuss the record keeping capabilities that you need built into the system. And again, know your system capabilities and characteristics. So these questions, again, can be in this document. That's what's listed up there. But just, there are a lot more. Didn't want to overwhelm you, overwhelm you with them. Um, permanent means as long as I am here. True or false? <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, we actually do see this attitude sometimes. <laughs> Anyone that's taken over from a predecessor with this attitude knows, right? Um, it's tempting to want to plan only as far ahead as we are personally invested or involved in an agency. If you know that you're going to retire in eight years, then answering questions about your agency's database will be whether or not or how long your agency's database will be able to maintain permanent records seems easy. You won't have to worry about it in eight years, and you feel certain that it won't be a problem before then. So <laughs> you confidently say, yes, of course the database will maintain these forever. Um, I don't think a means what you think a means. What does permanent mean to you? In the archiving world, permanent means forever. Never destroy, delete, lose through neglect, etc. To give you a little perspective, here are a couple of long-term retentions. These are real retentions. 50 years after dissolution of the republic, then destroy. 10,000 years, then destroy. That's not a permanent record. They're saying they can be destroyed. Sure, just when the nuclear waste no longer exists that they pertain to, right? Um, True or false? I only need to keep what I think is important and can discard the rest. <laughs> All right, I knew this one would be obvious, but still, some people seem to um, think that. So, appraising, oh, however, sorry, appraising the value of all government records is under the purview of the State Records Committee and the State Archivist, hence retention schedules. Um, however, assessing the importance of the records in question is a critical part 
of determining, and this is for you, um, determining in what format to create, preserve, and provide access to them. Uh, so I, I guess you could call it a risk assessment needs to be done by your agency in order to find a balance between the value of the records and the level of maintenance that you provide for them. So this is not uh, an exact diagram or even really an accurate tool. It's to show you generally what I'm trying to say by a risk assessment. So if the retention of a record is 10 years or longer, then maintaining it will be much more complex. As you've seen, then that involves the migration um, plan that you need to have. If it's less than 10 years, you won't need to migrate the data. It's a lot easier to, to commit to that, keeping them for less than 10 years. So retention is one consideration. Another is the importance. You need to think about the importance of the records to you, to the state, to you as in your agency, to the state, and in the eyes of the law. So are the records essential to your business continuing its operations? So COOP, right? Uh, in other words, if a natural or man-made disaster occurs, will you be able to resume operations without this record? Are the records used for audit or litigation? Are the records historically valuable with a permanent retention? Or on the other side of the scope, are they just administratively useful for a short amount of time to track something? Um, so you wouldn't want to invest okay, a lot of money and time in maintaining those really, really well if they're not important, is what I'm trying to say. The level of maintenance should match that. Um, right. Uh, true or false? Certain types of records need to be printed. It's a hard one. I stumped you, I think. Nobody wants to actually say it. <laughs> It's actually false, usually. <laughs> it was a trick one, sorry. Um, the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act talks about this and says that if the law requires that you have this record, um, you can keep it as an electronic record if it accurately reflects the information and it remains accessible. It also says that if a law requires a signature, an electronic signature satisfies the law. So I don't know, but SIT was attorneys. Maybe they've looked at this um, and have other things they have to consider. Um, because always, you know, that's the last word. There is one exception under the stated conditions that we just mentioned. Okay. So if a law enacted after May 1st, 2000 specifically prohibits the use of an electronic record for the specified purpose, that's the exception. There you go. Uh, printing an email is the correct way to maintain the official copy of the record. True or false? <laughs> That's false. Uh, I think at one time that was what people believed, but um, the printed PDF of the email does not contain all of the associated metadata, like IP addresses. Even though it has the to and the from and the this and the that and the time it was sent, uh, it is not considered a legitimate version of the record. This was established by the case law in 1996 when the Supreme Court ruled on Armstrong versus Executive Office of the President. Um, so what you actually need to do is export the emails into an email format and save them according to their retention, which is a whole another discussion. Uh, scanning is not the first step of digitizing, true or false? Yeah, that one's true. Planning, not scanning, is the first step of digitizing. And this is what we've been talking about today, a lot of these considerations. I do want to clear up just a couple things. For instance, resolution and file format are two separate things to consider. Um, resolution, if this is something that needs to be kept longer than 10 years, if it needs to be archival especially, you need to use 300 to 400 DPI. That's why you're your images aren't going to look good as if you don't use the appropriate resolution. 8-bit grayscale and 4 24 if you have something fancy that really needs to be in color. Um, file format is a different issue and TIFF can be both compressed and uncompressed and you, for archival purposes or really migration purposes if you have to migrate them at any point you need uncompressed um, TIFFs. Uh, PDA, a PDA, PF, PDF, PDFA Oh, these acronyms. PDFs can become PDFAs, and when they do, the A stands for archival. 
So it's like they graduate to archival quality. Um, really, it just freezes things so that in time and place so that they will remain static after um, that. So if you have done all your scanning in PDFs instead of TIFFs, um, know that you need to scan that you need to convert them into PDFAs if they are, have a permanent retention. Know that. Okay. Um, audio files should be in WAVE rather than MP3s or 4s. Um, data should be in CSV or XML, etc. So metadata, choose a schema. Uh, that's the, the, well, anyway, the options are things like Dublin Core or METS. There's various schemas. You need to choose one so you have consistency, and then you need to establish the level of metadata that you're requiring. So you guys know this. We talked about this a little bit earlier. So um, quality control procedures need to be instituted to verify and validate imaged information. How are you going to present them online? Um, UDOT uses project, project wise. I know Marriott Library at the U uses content DM, as do we. Um, different. Uh, Rosetta is a good one, especially for the archival side. There's just a lot of different products. Um, you just have to figure out what your needs are, as they've discussed. Um, and then preserving the resulting files, of course. Use a reliable storage medium, and then use today. But just going along with our true or false. CDs and DVDs are reliable storage mediums. True or false? Yeah, we'll go quickly, because you know this. They last three to seven years, depending on how they are treated. And they can be used if the records have a really short retention, and the loss of the records would pose a very low risk for an agency, or if they're only holding an access or a reference copy, not the record copy. Right, record copies subject to the retention schedules. The others aren't. Uh, flash drives, reliable? No. They actually last a little longer, five to eight years. Um, and they're good for transporting records, but not for storage. Uh, hard drives, internal or external? Sorry, I showed you the answer too quickly. They're not reliable. Um, the study that I found said one to eight years. They have 5% of them die by year one. These are internal hard drives. 20% die by year four. Um, so they can be used for an, an access or reference copy of the records. And they're a convenient way to transfer records, the external hard drives. That's, I mean, we use them. They have a purpose, but it's not storage medium of permanent records. M-Discs, which we talked about earlier today, um, are reliable. It's true. They last over a 1,000 years. It's been tested and certified. Well, it's sort of like carbon dating, right? We didn't live 10,000 years ago, but we, we think we can assume when things did. Anyway, um, they're ideal for preservation copy of permanent records, um, but they're actually convenient for all copies. M-Discs follow the ISO standards. Uh, when you put records on an M-Disc, you have to use an M-Disc drive to burn or write the files to the M-Disc, but you can actually use any disk drive to read the files on an M-Disc. And then there are some that are Blu-ray, and you'd have to use an M-Disc Blu-ray drive, and then you'd have to, anyway. Oh, we have a question. Oh, excellent. Um, the capacity, they have 4.7 gigabytes, 25 gigabytes, and 100 gigabytes are available, and they, the 50 gigabytes is coming soon. So this is the technology that he was talking about, just... Instead of burning the data into an organic dye layer like they do with DVDs on the left, M-Disk drives um, etch the data into a rock-like layer. That's why you have to have a specific uh, drive to burn or, or do that etching. So that's, that's that. So we do use those with the archives. In addition to microfilm, <laughs> so uh, is microfilm a reliable, reliable storage medium? It is. 500 years. Not the copies of the mi master microfilm is 500 years. If you get the blue, the diazo copies, not 500 years. Um, they're ideal for preservation copies. So we do still use, use these at the state archives um, because we store a lot of records forever, and so it's it's still a practical way for us to do so. And we have readers. I we do know most agencies don't have readers anymore. Um, they're really inconvenient for access copies for that reason, but they are. Um, human readable, which makes them valuable. You know, 500 years down the road, they might be the only thing still around. Who knows? Um, and digital files or paper can be converted to microfilm, and microfilm can be converted to digital files. 
Uh, we have a micrographics department at the State Archives that does that for a very reasonable cost. So it's not completely obsolete, but we know you're not really making them in your office anymore. So uh, a network server is a reliable storage medium, true or false? It depends. It's true and false, true or, or false. Um, depending on how the server is configured and the data audited and backed up. So I don't really want to get into the SAN versus NAS and the HDD versus SSD and the disk drive versus tape drive, etc. I don't. Um, there is a document called Offline Archive Media Trade Study prepared for the US Geological Survey that compares servers and contains uh, background, technical assessment, test results, recommendations based on design, capacity, cost per terabyte, cost of drive, compatibility, transfer rate, and vendor analyses. So they're looking at different products. Um, it's a great document if you're really trying to find a, a good quality uh, network server um, storage medium. So one important thing also that we have been covered, checksums need to be done and stored, and one th uh, and backup copies of essential and historical records. Three distinct locations. So, cloud storage is a reliable storage medium. True or false? <laughs> this one's true and false too. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it depends, right? It depends. That's why we don't. We're not great at saying yes and no, right? Uh, because it depends on the security, the redundancy that the and the redundancy that the vendor establishes. So cloud computing relies on shared computer resources. It's not really up in the cloud. Uh, it just means that it's off-site. A third-party vendor is the one buying and supplying all of that storage. Uh, agencies often use cloud services, including us sometimes, to save money and cut IT staffing and resource costs. Um, but here's, here's really the key. This is what can make it a reliable storage medium, and that is if the records manager ensures that contract language with a third-party vendor includes risk management issues relating to records management and access. So protection. Is your data kept separately from everyone else's data? Uh, security regarding all of those things, the backups, the data loss, data migration, all of those things need to be taken care of. And downtime and service restoration. So redundancy. Uh, you need to have it, again, in more than one place. They need to have more than one generator, that, that sort of issue. And then this is a key one, actually, getting the data out if you need to change service providers. Because some of them use proprietary programming codes, which means they can read your data, and that's all they care about. But you won't be able to. Um, also compliance with grammar and e-discovery e requests for records, and then records management requirements and integrity. So these we've talked about these things. I don't feel like we really need to go into too much. But keep in mind that some might charge fees for running the checksums per item every time they're cost prohibitive. So you need to be sure you understand those kinds of things, uh, what you're getting into. In summary, weigh the strengths and weaknesses of each media format and identify which would best suit the record copy and any additional copies of record that you manage. All right, true or false, it's cheaper to store records as paper than in my database. It's true. Here's one of the reasons why, is because the State Archives has a records center where you can store your paper records free. That's pretty hard to beat. Um, and some of these costs might be outdated. Apparently, UCI does scans for one cent per image, but my data set $1.85 was about as low as you could expect. But um, so storage of paper records is cheaper than storage of electronics. Some people feel like digital means free, uh, but it's not true. Uh, DTS, about $64.31 per gigabyte, gigabyte per month. So you just have to know. You just have to know before you go, right? You just have to weigh, do the cost for your specific situation. These are just kind of overall things. And, and take into account, I mean, there's a difference between taking what you have in paper and creating digital records and managing digital records that are born digitally, right? Not, not quite the same thing. And eventually, I think we'll all be born digital. Our records, excuse me, will all be born digital, not us. Um, 
But right now, it's the stopgap time that, that uh, Lisa was talking about, like at CITLA, where they're doing both. They're, it's this redundancy. Um, so we're still in kind of that awkward growing phase, I guess you could say. So it really, it just comes down to your situation, but take into account the costs. Um, going paperless, oh, the reason, sorry, that I mentioned this is because this is an argument you'll hear a lot from us. When you have permanent records and you want to destroy the paper, we'll say, why don't you just give them to us? And then you never have to see them again. But we can store them more cheaply that way. So that's the reason. The end. Going paperless will save a lot of time, true or false. All right, now you know I don't always commit. So it can be true or it can be false. It just depends. Um, scanning in the documents, putting them into folders on a, on a drive, that's not really going to save you money over a decent ba uh, paper-based filing system. However, if you're replacing processes that are, and you've seen this from, from UDOT and from CITLA, how great it can be for transforming a process, making it really user-friendly for the constituents, right? So it can be a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Um, you need organization for the data, you need metadata, you need to be able to key, hopefully keyword search through the documents, which you can get either if they're text embedded or if you run um, OCR, optical character recognition software, which Acrobat, Acrobat Adobe Pro 10 has, um, Adobe Acrobat Pro 10, and others, other vendors. So there are ways to make it really, really convenient. And then also digitizing all of the handshakes, the, the annotations, the signatures, the email, all of those things can help. And then having backup, of course, it's reliable in case things go bye-bye, really, all at once. So going paperless is all or nothing, true or false? Great, that's false. Now uh, you want to pick the low-hanging fruit. So identify the places where you will get the best return on your investment and start there. So that's kind of what they were talking about, these processes that have really benefited them so much is where they invested a lot of time and money. Um, so we've got a couple examples there, but you heard a couple examples that were better. This one's true. Having a chicken, this is my favorite one, having a chicken farm shred sensitive records is an appropriate destruction plan. True or false? No, it's false. Sorry. Um, this happened just last month, September 23rd, 2015. I know, I'm not making this up. So this is a Canadian long-term care company, so we're talking like a rest home, is in hot water over its plan to let a chicken farm shred sensitive health documents. A chicken farm, this is a quote, should not be used to dispose of sensitive health documents, <laughs> said Ron Krasinski. It's crazy that anyone had to actually say this, right? Uh, this is Saskatchewan's Privacy and Information Commissioner. As he announced, he was canceling the agreement, according to media sources. The contract put the burden of maintaining the security and confidentiality of the records on the chicken farm, but did not require that chicken farm specify a plan of how that would happen. Some of the residents' health cards ended up in a recycling bin, which is how it came out. So uh, there you go. You just never know what you're going to see. Um, appropriate destruction of records, just, just in case you were wondering if the chicken farm was a good idea. Shredding or burning by a reputable company, so information cannot be pieced back together or recovered. If your uh, records are stored in the state records center, by the way, when the retention is met, the records will be destroyed at no cost to you uh, after you have designed, designed excuse me, a destruction notice giving permission because they still are in your custody while they're there. Um, all copies of a record should be destroyed with the record copy, um, which some people don't like that one either. But if you think about it, if you destroy the record copy, but you still have one or two other copies, what are they now? Yes, you guys, you get it. Yes, then they're the record copy. Uh, so yes, everything has to go when the retention says. So, um, And then, of course, document the disposal of records in a destruction log. Because then discovery requests, grammar requests, oh, it's so nice to be able to say, I don't have that record, and here's why. Right? Whew. Best, best grammar res responses ever. Yeah, that one's easy. Uh, true. We're a stakeholder, so we want to know. Right? That's what they were talking about earlier. Please let your records analysts know how you are using electronic records and what processes, and if you are making significant changes, or even if you are just considering it and have questions, let us know. Um, we also will come to your agency and provide training if you would prefer. We're always happy to do that, even one-on-one -on -one training. 
Uh, every governmental agency has a records analyst, just in case you were wondering. Um, Ray Gifford is our new records analyst, and she handles state agencies with a few exceptions. Um, and she handles education. Lorianne Outerkirk is our records analyst for local agencies, that's counties, municipalities, special districts. She also handles all law enforcement, including highway patrol, and the Department of Health, just because they are special. And I handle elect elected state agencies, courts, legislature, and Rebecca Shaw handles our general retention schedules. So, in conclusion, can we destroy the paper original of a record after scanning? Briefly, the answer is yes, but. And the longer the retention period of that record is, the louder that but gets because of the difficulties that come with preserving electronic records. It is perfectly acceptable to keep a scanned document and uh, just it just needs to be designated as the records cop a record copy and retained and accessible for the full retention period, which is not as easy as it sounds. Questions? Yes, the gentleman on the right. First of all, thank you. I have two questions. One is, how do you, if you contract with a, a cloud storage service provider, uh, and you go through all the details of the contract, how do you efficiently ensure that they're compliant with that? Since by definition, they're out of sight. <laughs> Is that why they're called cloud? I can never figure that one out. Um, yeah, you would want to make sure that the contract includes any, that's the auditing that they're talking about. Um, you would want to be in touch with them and, and have verbiage in the, the contract that makes sure that they're accountable to you. That might even so. allow you to do a site visit, for example. Yeah, if you it know, were feasible. That might be possible. It would depend on them and what their rules are. Okay. Um, they have high security. We actually uh, got to go visit one recently, but we had to leave our driver's license at the check-in desk. So that's pretty um, secure. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the second question. Uh, I work at the Office of Education. We have an enormous data warehouse. We do. Uh, a, a fraction of the reports we produce out of that are pre-specified annual sorts of things. Okay. The, the mo for the most part, we do a lot of reports uh, based on ad hoc requests, many of them, most of them from outside of the agency. Uh, we have a process for handling those and so on. But this presentation has me wondering about the publicness not that people would have access to individual student records, which is right. a big political deal right now, but just our obligation to provide a report, since actually we rarely do two reports the same way because we can customize them to individual interests and requests. Mm -hmm. What kind of obligation do we have to produce reports out of our data warehouse? Uh, upon request? Is that what yes. you're asking? Well, that's a grammar question, and I'm going to refer you to our state records ombudsman, Rosemary Cundiff, who actually, there's her data right there at the bottom. Um, I, yeah, I'm not going to get into a, a specific okay. grammar, but we definitely can talk, and Rosemary will want to help you with that Okay. specifically. Great. But, Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, a pure lady in the grayish pullover. <laughs> it's hard to tell. It looks grayish to me. Just to check, all of these presentations are going to be on the State Archive website? Uh, Lorianne, are all of them except, I think... There's, excuse me. There are a few presenters who wanted to have more control over their content, so they will be providing to us a link to their website. Um, so you should be able to access everything um, through our website or on our website. And when, because I'm impatient like everybody else. <laughs> I'll try to get them up in the next couple of weeks. Give us some time. <laughs> It'll be pretty quick. But I'll tell you what I'm taking to them tomorrow off, so it won't be tomorrow. <laughs> no, it, it, we're usually pretty fast about it. And actually, because we recorded the whole thing, you'll be able to see these on YouTube over and over again if you want. <laughs> so, does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank you.